Imagine a Britain beaming with wildlife, large carnivores roaming the lands, woodlands covering the hillsides, a truly wild Britain. This existed not so long ago, and there is now a call for this landscape to be returned. This movement has been coined Rewilding Britain. The idea is to restore the wild ecosystems of Britain, both terrestrial and marine, to a state that existed before human activity manipulated the land for agriculture and population expansion. At its peak 5,000 years ago, woodland covered much of Britain, but what we see today barely resembles that picture of our recent past. So what happened? The Neolithic farmers arrived. There was an increase in human settlement, an introduction of livestock and domesticated animals, and a mass clearing and burning of woodland for agriculture. 50% of the original woodland was lost by 500 AD, along with a number of fauna species. Rewilding is a controversial subject. It appears that many support the basic fundamentals of increasing ecotourism, educating and engaging the public with nature, and increasing the longevity and sustainability of our ecosystems. Any of these can be achieved by many routes, such as the RSPB's campaign to give nature a home, the Marine Conservation Society's Great British Beach Cleanup, and protecting vulnerable species and their habitats. This is not enough for some. Britain used to have more species roam its land, and there is a call for them to be returned. However, the species in question are causing quite a debate. We'll be focusing on three species that are currently of particular prevalence. These are the beaver, wolf and lynx. The IUCN defines a reintroduction as the intentional movement and release of an organism inside its indigenous range from which it has disappeared. For a reintroduction to be considered, there must be suitable habitat where there is a gap in the native range of a species. Natural recolonisation must be unlikely. The species must have become locally extinct from anthropogenic factors rather than natural. The issues that caused the extinction must no longer be a threat, and the individuals being reintroduced must come from stable populations. The first mammal to be reintroduced to Britain was the European beaver. Hunted to extinction in the 16th century for pelt, meat and glandular secretions. The beaver is now back amongst the British fauna. Over the years, beavers have escaped from private land in Devon and in Tayside. But in 2009, a Scottish beaver trial commenced in the Knapdale Forest. Four families from Scandinavia were released on the Argyll River and their activities and impacts have been recorded since. But why has their reintroduction been perceived to be so important? Beavers are considered to be a keystone species. Beaver dams can slow water flow during floods and sustain flow during drier bouts. They improve water quality and absorb agricultural runoff, reducing pollution. By creating freshwater habitat, their presence can benefit populations of otters, water shrew and water voles, birds, dragonflies and other insects, and breeding fish. Overall, there was a positive effect on fish, but there were some cases where the beavers had a negative impact on migrating salmon. In these cases, salmon boards had the power to remove or manage the interfering beaver dams. In the Knapdale trial area, over 13 square kilometres of freshwater habitat has been created. This is a major benefit for a lot of species, but it can have an impact on local communities. It is believed that through the slow release of water through the dams, flooding in the lowlands can be reduced, but this could also cause a problem for farmers. There are some kinds of farmland which are so highly um, vulnerable because they're um, so liable to flooding and so heavily drained that the presence of a beaver um, or, or beavers can be a problem. There are ways around this. Aside from removing dams and potentially relocating troublesome animals, a method being pushed to manage problem dams is by the use of the beaver deceiver. This flow device enables beavers to behave naturally in the belief that their dam is watertight, whilst actually enabling water to flow at a relatively normal rate. Electric fencing and wire mesh can also be used to protect desired trees. Compensation in the Knapdale trial area has also been rewarded to farmers and landowners negatively impacted by the beavers. Fortunately, this is a relatively small sum. In the Tayside area in Scotland, where beavers escaped from private land, 
The Tayside Beaver Study Group has been offering advice to landowners on how to cope with beavers in the area. Andrew Bauer with the NFU Scotland points out that the reintroduction of beavers in Napdale should be treated much differently to the escaped individuals in the Tayside area. This area is located on a low-lying stretch of land, very susceptible to flooding. Farmers employ various techniques to move the water from their land as quickly as possible. Anything that may compromise the stability and efficiency of the drainage ditches is bad news. Unfortunately, these matters may be difficult to resolve. Some argue that it is the constant trampling of the soil by livestock and tractors that cause the flood banks to burst whereas others argue that it is the presence of beavers that cause the damage. As a legal and responsible reintroduction, it appears that most have supported the Scottish beaver trial. However, it must be noted that releases and escapees will cause conflict when their effects are unknown and the correct management and manpower are not in place to control them. The Scottish Government will decide in 2016 whether or not the trial was a success, potentially allowing the beavers to stay in Britain. Also considered a keystone species is the wolf. Their reintroduction to Yellowstone National Park in the US has been testament to this. Brought back in 1995, scientists had noticed their effect on the ecosystem, right down to the spawning fish in the rivers. It would first appear that the two groups of species are not interlinked, or have a negative correlation as wolves have been found to predate on salmon migrations. But something has happened in Yellowstone National Park that has shown the truly great effect of tropic cascades, a chain reaction of events causing changes in population sizes right down to the primary producers. Wolf presence started its effect by altering the grazing patterns of red deer. The red deer now face serious risk of predation to avoided areas they would be easily caught. In those areas, cottonwood, aspen and willow all regenerated in their absence. More trees and shrubs provided more habitats for birds and more berries for bears. The aspen provided wood for beavers that are themselves ecosystem engineers, improving fish spawning sites. And then you could go full circle and say that the wolves benefit once again when they feed on these fish. These examples merely brush the surface of changes and improvements to the complex food web that exists. An increase in the number of trees not only improves the beaver populations, they also stabilise riverbanks and reduce the amount of meandering, reshaping the landscape. Yellowstone National Park is once again a fully functioning, self-sustaining ecosystem, all thanks to the reintroduction of wolves. But is this all transferable to Britain? As many of the key species in Yellowstone or their equivalents occur in Britain, there is the potential for the wolves to have a very similar effect. Wolves were hunted to extinction by the 15th century at the hands of humans as they were perceived to be pests. As a result, deer in Britain currently have no natural predators, so a wolf's presence could alter their behaviour and feeding habits, relieving pressure on the regenerating forests. Furthermore, wolves could naturally help reach the Deer Commission for Scotland's target deer densities. The Forestry Commission Scotland spends over £9 million a year on deer management. Imagine the savings that could be made on top of boosting ecotourism. But with the reintroduction of wolves comes a real threat of livestock predation. It has been reported that in some areas of Europe, up to 200 sheep have been killed by one pack in one night. And although regionally, livestock deaths occur at very low percentages, local impacts could be devastating for individual farmers. Several ideas have been posed to manage human-wolf conflicts. There's a system I read about um, that, that has worked in, 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 I think, Central America and some states of America um, over species like the Kula and the Jaguar. And what they've done is they've given the farmers camera traps on their land and they've asked the farmers to go and, you know, collect the spools and be, you know, put on their, put it up on their computer and see whether they've got any photographs. And if the farmer gets a photograph of a cougar or a jaguar or whatever various cats they have there, they send him a check. The other thing we saw in America was the use of, of guard dogs, and we've seen it in France and Romania as well. And the, the shepherds, you know, just have these dogs that are trained to look after the sheep and chase away the predators. But Andrew Bauer, with the NFU Scotland, reiterates that unless there are willing private funders, the UK's economy, enrolling in a national minimum wage system, is too advanced to support the underpaid job of a shepherd and its guard dog. 
The final stigma around wolves is the risk of human attacks. Years of fairy tales and folklore have branded the big bad wolf a monster. In books and films today, they are still being given a ruthless reputation. Although it exists, wolves actually pose very little threat to humans. Normally in the wild, if wolves see people, they run in the other direction. They can smell you from two miles away, so you won't even notice they've seen you before they've run away. Um, for example, the last 100 years in North America, only two people have really been killed by wolves. Um, doesn't mean it's never happened in the past, but we create situations where it can be a possibility. With all this in mind, many experts have ruled out the possibility of a reintroduction of wolves for one crucial reason. There is simply not enough available habitat to support the iconic species. If we look at wolves and how they survive, our country isn't big enough. Uh, it's too heavily populated. They'd get killed by roads. If you did put them up into Scotland, you'd have to tell um, Cornwall that they're on their way because they would disperse all the way down. So it's not as simple as just putting them and keeping them where you want them to be. One study has suggested that 10,000 square kilometres of habitat is required to sustain genetically viable populations of wolf. The Scottish Highlands is less than half this size, and while some believe the wolves could survive there, they would naturally disperse beyond the invisible boundaries of the national park into more densely populated, more intensively farmed surrounding lowlands. Whilst the reintroduction of the wolf currently looks unlikely, through continued debate and education and increasing efforts to rewild via other routes, in 30 years time, the story might be different. Also hotly contending the list of possible reintroductions is the lynx. The shy species has been an underdog in the story of rewilding Britain. They are an ambush predator found in woodlands. Like the wolf, the main benefit of the lynx is to reduce deer numbers. Not only will the lynx predate on roe deer, but they would also hunt the invasive, non-native seeker deer. Presence of lynx could therefore help the regenerating forest and preserve its own habitat. There is also a small chance that the lynx could reduce fox numbers. If this happened, this would reduce the meso-predator release effect that currently exists in Britain. The meso-predator release results when an apex predator is removed from the food chain, boosting the populations of their prey and thus adding pressure on the lower levels of the food chain. Adding the lynx as an apex predator could restrict the fox's damage on poultry and game birds, as well as small mammals. The main driver of the lynx extinction in Britain was as a result of human-driven habitat loss. They were also persecuted as it was thought they were a culprit of livestock depredation, and this is a main concern for their reintroduction. Throughout most of Europe, lynx predation on livestock is minimal. It is highest in Sweden, where sheep graze in the woodland, prime lynx habitat. Agriculture in Britain does not currently operate in the same manner as Sweden, so many disregard this as an issue. But comparing British agriculture with Europe should not be taken so literally, Andrew Bauer of the NFUS warns. Scotland is expanding its forests and trying to push for a practice of agroforestry. This aims to integrate grazing livestock and growing trees to increase efficiency of woodland ecosystems whilst maintaining livestock. So although lynx would currently have minimal effect on livestock, as seen in Eastern and Central Europe that currently operate similar farming techniques to Britain, a move to a system more similar to that seen in Sweden would dramatically change the outcome. As for available habitat, Scotland may have plenty. An individual lynx has a home range of about 120 km squared, so for a viable population to exist there must be plenty of interconnected woodland. David Hetherington assessed the available space in a research paper published in 2008. He found a potential of 15,000 km squared of suitable habitat in the Scottish Highlands and 5,000 km squared in the southern uplands, with a further 800 km squared of potential habitat in the northeast of England. Since 2008, woodlands have grown, and between 2012 and 2022, the Forestry Commission hoped to plant 100,000 hectares, or 1,000 square kilometres, of trees in Scotland, strengthening the viability of suitable habitat for lynx. There are currently no concrete plans for a trial reintroduction, but both the Lynx Trust UK and a new charity, Rewilding Britain, are working to make it a possibility in the near future. There are many advantages and drawbacks to reintroducing species back into an ecosystem. What must occur in order for rewilding to be successful is public interaction and discussion. It is vital that those whom will be most affected have a voice. Educating the country about the importance of biodiversity and changing preconceived perceptions about wildlife may prove to be vital in future years. 
But is there still a place in our ecosystems for these large mammals to once again roam? Do the advantages outweigh the disadvantages? Can we in Britain live alongside large carnivores in today's society? The choice is ours.